Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Take Back Manufacturing with Industry 4.0. Just a few housekeeping notes before we begin. Uh, we are recording today's session. Everyone registered will receive an email with a link to the on-demand version of today's session and a copy of our presentation slides within the next few days. The session will run for a total of 60 minutes, which, in, which includes time for questions and answers towards the end. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please feel free to submit them through the Q&A panel on your GoToWebinar console so that we can address them towards the end of the presentation. My name is Jonathan Smythe. I've been with Share Global for 10 years uh, as a business systems consultant and have a background in production and commercial management, supplying the likes of Marks & Spencer. I also have 20 plus years of providing IT solutions to blue chip companies, more specifically around the Microsoft Dynamics product family within manufacturing and distribution companies. A little bit of an introduction to Shea Global. Um, our why or our reason for being is that we believe there is the potential for excellence in every single business. And our passion is, glide, uh, is guiding our clients to operational excellence. In terms of our lo uh, locations, uh, we operate globally. So we have offices uh, within Toronto, Vancouver, uh, the UK, Pune in India, uh, and the Philippines. So we have a broad reservoir of uh, resources throughout the globe to help you with any projects that you may have. Um, we recently ran a series of webinars around uh, funding initiatives, which can be located uh, on our website. But just to give you a, a bit of a brief overview of the type of things that we were covering, um, we have the ability um, to reclaim research and development tax relief. So HM Revenue and Customs defines R&D tax qualifying areas through a number of different guidelines, such as looking for uh, an advance in technology or science, if there's uncertainty in how to find or get to the advance. Um, looking at uh, how the, this could be uh, overcome uh, without the help of a, a professional in the field um, and where the, the answer is not readily deducible. Um, there are a, a number of different areas which would qualify. Um, and on the next slide, we can see that these areas might include software development, automation, um, this can apply to both uh, successful and failed projects um, the development of innovative recipes, the development of uh, innovative formulas, new materials, improvements in process and the development of new and improved products. And of course, not forgetting development of environmental products uh, as well. I have pleasure today in introducing uh, our main speaker, Nigel Southway. Uh, Nigel is an independent business consultant, uh, manufacturing engineer, and the author of Cycle Time Management. Among his many areas of expertise, Nigel educates and coaches worldwide on continuous improvement and lean initiatives, supply chains uh, and building sustainable supply chains, uh, advanced manufacturing, engineering, and industry 4.0 strategies and implementation. Nigel has been the architect of change for many organizations across many industrial sectors and is also the leading advocate for the Take Back Manufacturing Forum uh, and for the North American Reshoring Initiative in Canada. Over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I uh, got control. Okay, I'm sorry, I, I'm having trouble with the controls, Marina, so. Um, I think maybe if you potentially try the, at the bottom left of the slide, yeah. uh, be able to see the arrows there, that should help. Mm. No, sir. Okay. 
There we have it. Okay, there we go. I came back. Okay, sorry, uh, sorry about that. Uh, hello, UK. Um, and you, you, you may be able to detect a slight West Country of England accent, uh, although it's been a very long time since I relocated from England as a young manufacturing engineer and moved to North America, but uh, it's been a while. Um, and yeah, it's true. I've been in the manufacturing industry for a very long time and I've lived through most of the third industrial revolution. Uh, and, and now I'm assisting manufacturing practitioners grapple with the fourth industrial revolution. So, so welcome to this new age. And, uh, you know, we'll be basically as a, as one of the early authors on lean thinking, I've had the opportunity to educate and assist many clients on lean thinking in many different sectors. So I've not been, you know, confined to just one uh, business sector and because it's provided me with a very clear view now of how industry four can support uh, the future of these these different sectors. And I want to share that with you today. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to the agenda will be I'll, I'll talk a bit about the basically taking back manufacturing. I obviously um, living in, in Canada, there's a lot that's related basically to Canada. But I'm sure I'm very sure as we talk through this. Um, that you know, it's, it, it, the Western world is pretty common in terms of what it's it's experiencing as far as manufacturing is concerned. So I'm sure you'll be able to follow um, whatever um, parallel uh, we, we have here. So then I'll talk about Industry 4 and, and our version of what we think that is, so it's in position. Um, and then I'll, I'll talk about how Industry 4 can be an essential booster shot uh, to reshore and, re and take back your manufacturing activities. And then I'll talk about the roadmap of what steps should you take uh, for for Industry 4 uh, to start the journey. So first of all, let's talk about take back manufacturing. Um, and and I know a little bit, not too much about what's happening in the UK, but I you know what I've read is it's pretty similar. Um, and I'll tell you about my personal experience. I think a lot of us have probably common experiences of what's what's happened to us in the last 30 years. And so um, uh, for me. Uh, around the late 90s, I was asked to go to Mexico um, as part of our NAFTA environment and, and start up a, a, a Mexican facility. Um, actually, it's Maquilador on the border of Mexico um, with the U.S. And then uh, that was a good experience. Uh, it took a while to figure out how to work with a, you know, in a foreign land with, a, you know, a startup situation in, a, in an emerging economy. Um, and that took a while. Then we basically, for one of my clients, I relocated and started working on globalized manufacturing from about 2004. And I went to China uh, to assist with uh, moving manufacturing to China for our, our own domestic market. Um, and you know, look, look, there's a lot of pretty things and people in China, but Canadian, uh, Chinese manufacturing wasn't one of them. Uh, we, we certainly uh, have a lot of issues with output and quality and just basically getting um, to a, the right place as far as a good, good capable um, uh, industrial capability uh, just to actually put them on 40 foot containers and start bringing in product. Uh, but after a while we got success and we were able to, uh, we got pretty good. We made a lot of friends and a lot of things were under control by, you know, after about five years. Um, and then around about 2010, I came home to, you know, closed doors uh, manufacturing. Uh, the future of manufacturing in Canada is probably similar to the UK in this regard that it was hollowed out, declining, no, no capitalization, and pretty much, uh, you know, I felt really bad about um, the, the journey I'd assisted with, and that was the genesis of our own Take Back Manufacturing Initiative, where we got together and decided that, you know, we should talk it up and and, and start advocating um, for the restoration of manufacturing. So I've been talking about this since 2010. Um, just to put in in perspective, I have plenty of uh, material in the article section of this presentation on the North American environment. I wanted to give you something that's actually to do with UK, um, and this is a you know a pretty good summary of the situation where there's been a continual decline uh, since the onset of globalization, with not particularly any upturn in sight uh, in pretty much all the Western world. Um, there's you know if you look at the bottom right trend, you'll see that Britain and the United States, which we kind of work closely with and track with, um, we've all seen significant decline, double digits in some cases. Um, and so we've you've lost, you know, in the past decade alone, 16% of the manufacturing base, about 600,000 jobs, which actually happens to be close to what we lost in Canada over a couple of decades. So it's a declined 
hollowed out situation, which we, we we're all very unhappy with, quite frankly, if we're manufacturers and also if we're concerned about our economic balance. And so that's that's the that's the situation that we're in and it's, it needs work. So the three parallel imperatives that we see to make that reshoring or, or take back in, take back manufacturing happen is threefold. And, and there's really uh, uh, three things to do. We need government to start uh, working on industrial policy and, and uptick on the political will and get a realignment so that we have a level playing field for, for uh, reshoring or, or returning manufacturing to localizing, uh, localizing economy uh, situation. So that's the first thing. So it's def definitely a government thing that we need uh, more focus on. I'm sure as advocates, we've been campaigning in that regard. The other component, which has made some progress, uh, but a long way to go, is the educational system that needs to improve its balance between education and training, and in fact, uh, also experience-based training. Um, and you know, I'm a product of, uh, in the 60s, 1965, I started my British engineering apprenticeship, um, and I enjoyed that experience. And unfortunately, that, that certainly in most Western countries, it was dismantled uh, in past years. And now many of us in many countries are trying to reinstall um, that environment for our young people so that we can relife um, our, our, our skilled workforce. And so we need to balance the educational system so that it's more of an experiential, experiential learning system rather than just pure education, then you're thrown to the, to the environment. Um, the, the third one is industry needs to improve and mobilize. And you know, we've seen, um, un, uh, unfortunately, um, a self-deprecating uh, situation where we've not invested in new, new technologies or capital, um, and we got out of date. And we're, we're now, unfortunately, also see a lot of industries, certainly here in Canada, that have f forgotten how to self-improve, how to do continuous improvement, and because they've offshored everything, and, and, and there's no culture to actually uh, maintain what they've got and so there needs a reboot required as far as industry is concerned to to move forward and quite frankly industry four will be a good vehicle for that that reboot this is a slide on on some work we've been doing with the u.s uh, obviously we're very jealous of the focus that the u.s is enjoying on manufacturing uh you know political will is high um, and we see a lot of good things happening. Unfor you know, fortunately, Canada can share in that. Um, but uh, if you don't have uh, a strong initi initiative government-wise, obviously you can enjoy um, that kind of combined operational activity. Uh, but reshoring is the word people use for bringing manufacturing back, but it's bigger than just reshoring. We need to rebuild what we've got. Um, you can't just bring it back. You've got to earn the right. Um, it's not welcome back manufacturing, it's take back manufacturing, and you've got to work on it. Um, they, that's really the situation I see for most Western countries. We've lost a lot of ground. Um, our infrastructure, as well as our capitalization, has taken a hit, and we need to get it back. So, <clears throat> one of the things that will help that is Industry Four. So, let's just talk about, you know, what I perceive Industry Four to be, and per perhaps it's common, um, but um, it's really moving us towards the age of technological disruption. <clears throat> Um, really, it, it, some people call it a new lean, green, automated and integrated approach. And I want to not disagree with that, but it's probably an easier way to say it. And I'm going to do that next. Um, so the first thing is you've got. Um, next slide. You got history to look at. If you look at the industrial revolution, and we've been through about three. We've had uh, what was basically steam-driven technology, then electrics, um, and then we went to uh, through the 80s and so on. We had basically the journey of putting computers and automation in, into our factories, and so we went from what was really a very basic process when I started with paper tape and you know very mechanical devices for for doing things to uh, by the 80s a a, a start in terms of computerization, even though it was still, unfortunately, uh, not real time. And now, of course, we enjoy um, computers that are more at the point of use. Uh, we're using them for manufacturing processes, uh, for not only manufacturing, but inspection and testing. Uh, we have a lot of mobility um, on our hip, 
um, and we've got good integration to some degree. So the computer side of it, the actual IT side is, is doing good, um, but it's still not cyber physical. And I want to point that out. In most environments, it's a question mark as to whether it's actually moving towards Industry 4. And, uh, you know, let's just talk about what that is. Industry 4 is cyber physical systems. It's about connecting computers to processes without human intervention. And for, unfortunately, a lot of our applications in the third revolution um, put the people between the process and the computers. Our, our employees were trapped between, you know, the, the computing activity and the process activity. And they were like, really like the weakest link in some cases. So cyber physical is about getting rid of that. And it, if you look at this pre-cyber physical environment, there's a lot of technology there, but there's hands involved. You got a lot of manual effort to deploy that technology, probably at higher cost. Um, some opportunity for errors or certainly inaccuracy because of human intervention. And it's not real time or you know, it could be outdated information because of that. And so what cyber physical is, is to, is to stop that thought. And actually, you know, if you think of it as a, as a hand issue, you know, we got to, get rid of the hands, no hands, please. You know, we're, we're dealing with a culture now of eliminating the human hand interface with our, with our processes between the processes and the computers. And that is really the definition of cyber physical. So how are we gonna get there? Well, there's some disruptive innovation technologies out there that's driving us forward, uh, fortunately. I'm gonna talk about the top three uh, one by one and explain how they play. Uh, for industry four. And the first one is some people call it networks. I call it connectivity because that's really what it does. You, you're connecting stuff together. You're making sure you've got seamless integration of information. Some people call it the industrial internet of things, um, but it's got up to a good start. We've seen uh, quite a lot of growth in the ability to connect things together through our, 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 our networks facilities. And obviously every country is looking at improving that. Um, so, so that's really underway and, it, you know, every single activity, if it's connected, can then be, of course, more industry four compatible and you don't need a human hand, no pay for flow or, or hand flow to get things done. The next one is at the sharp end, at the, at the actual processing end, um, we need to move to more advanced automation, uh, robots are part of it, but really it's about automation that's smart. Um, and we've got embedded sensor technology so that we can feel and see uh, the machines can, you know, basically act, act at the part of being the interface directly with the process without human intervention. Um, and now there's been some distraction of getting this done due to low cost country labor utilization. We've been offshoring stuff and we haven't, and labor has been cheap, of course, in that culture. And so we haven't bothered to embrace um, smart technology for automation, but it's it's been flatlined for a while and now we see an upturn as we start to recapitalize. And as new, as capitalization takes place to some degree, advanced, ro advanced automation will occur because most of the providers are moving, uh, or most of the OEMs for equipment are beginning to uh, move towards the smart technology for their products. And so as we recapitalize, we'll naturally see um, the ability to have this advanced manufacturing technology as part of our businesses. It'll still be a challenge to hook it together, but as work sells, we'll probably uh, see some improvements. A third one, which uh, is called artificial intelligence, but it's really taking the strength now that we have in computing power and combining that with the ability to build algorithms to take the sting out of the overhead out of doing some of the manual decision-making. So let's take the middle band of you know, low-end decision-making and computerize that, um, and so a lot of our uh, straightforward decision processes can be computerized using artificial intelligence and handled with the ability to handle large amounts of data to, to accomplish that. So those are the three real key technological issues that need or revolutionary issues that need to be understood. Um, but there's something else. We still need a handshake with continuous improvement and lean because unfortunately, um, if you automate something with the waste in it, it's not going to be effective. And so the old adage of lean is you eliminate the waste first and then you automate uh, sticks with industry four. And so uh, there's a lot of work required to pre-plan pre your processes so they end up becoming 
lean so that you can layer industry force solutions on top of a, a lean uh, process rather than embed that waste at the get-go. So that's really my version of Industry 4. Um, it's, it's no hands, please, and uh, make sure there's no waste to boot. Um, the next thing is Industry 4. Why does it sort of work for helping manufacturing come back? And I'm going to explain that more with an economic review here. So let's take a bigger picture view of why business will reshore to local trade jurisdictions. Well, there's many factors. There's political factors. Um, there's, there's sustainability factors, and there's also quite frankly, economic factors, and I'm going to talk about the economic factors here now. Um, if you look at globalization, the way it's been driven and the way it's evolved, it's just not working for certainly the Western world and probably not for the planet. Um, and so we need to start to rethink globalization, certainly as far as globalizing manufacturing is concerned. Uh, you know, it's traditionally been moving container ships around, taking material from one place moving it to a low cost country for labor and then shipping it back to or to a consumer somewhere else. And, and that's worked pretty good. We've improved our supply chains to do that. Um, but unfortunately, it's, that's, not, <laughs> that's not really going to be sustainable as far as we can see in the future. So let's take a look at where we've been uh, in a global supply chain. We've had, and some people, of course, um, have resources. UK doesn't have as much as Canada, so you'll see the resources are there. Um, as if it's Canada, but whatever your, your your supply chain environment, you're going to take long supply chains to get things done. You're going to move things or take things from low cost countries and have them shipped in with container ships over long supply chain distances. And so the the amount of inventory trapped in that supply chain, that long supply chain, is 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 considerable. And right now it works because we've got low uh, we've got low interest rates. If interest rates go back to the normal level we need for a, a capitalizing society, then uh, we're not going to be able to afford these these long supply chains. And quite frankly, as we'll show, it doesn't make business sense anyway. So that's where we've been in the last 30 years or so. And where we're headed in a lot of cases is um, localized trade blocks that are um, tighter, shorter supply chains. And you're, yes, you're adding real resources if you don't have them, but You'll use the resources you've got if you've got them. And your trade activity will not be duplicious. Um, there will be knowledge trade, perhaps, to help the emerging markets, but you're going to have balanced trade within, within your trade block. And so that's the modern you know, update to globalization. We won't need the ships. We can sink those or repurpose them. Um, and we'll also save some pollution because, unfortunately, they're one of the largest polluters on the planet. The other factor that's interesting is that as you do this, you bring lo manufacturing more locally to your consumer base. And as we know, manufacturing is one of the components of innovation. It, it's needed for strong innovation incubation. And so we can have a better environment for developing new products if we've got manufacturing uh, part of our process. If you're manufacturing somewhere else, um, there's a lot of IP transfer and a lot of issues with um, how well you can actually execute a and innovate a new product. So that's the other givey as far as uh, shortening up those supply chains and having a, a localized trade block. So that is the future. And some people say it this way, we gotta make much more of what we consume with, if we can, more of our own resources as much as practical. So that might be the mantra for where we're headed. Um, so, Okay, we've got to be realistic. Not everything is going to be localized. There will still be globalized manufacturing activities. Um, not everything will be reshored, but we've got to get to a, a far better balance point. Um, and there's reasons why it will happen uh, and why that balance point will occur, and I'll get there next. Um, but first of all, let's just make sure we know that long supply chains, for all kinds of reasons, are far less sustainable. Um, and that's one of the theories now that's been that's promoting, in general, the move towards localizing what we do. So, so why are these five advanced technologies dr driven together as Industry 4, uh, the top three for sure, going to be the disruptors to level the manufacturing playing field between low-cost labor and developed countries? So I'll, I'll go to that next and just take a look. You know, so everybody's saying, hey, you know, low-cost labor is the king. Uh, that's how we've thought for the last three decades, and we've taken you know, we've moved things to where the labor is cheapest. 
um, and then managed it with long supply chains. Well, when we ran the numbers, and this is a story really of, of you know, over the last uh, um, 15 years. In 2010, when I was in China, uh, in really kind of the first phase of globalization, we didn't really understand the hidden costs of being offshore. Um, and so the difference between globalized supply and local supply, we were thinking we were enjoying a 25% advantage in, in being um, globalized. But when we ran the numbers in 2015 and Boston Consulting Group have done, we did a lot of work with those guys to figure out the real facts. We were at the tipping point in quite a few commodities um, if we had actually capitalized them properly locally. And so we, were, we actually had a case where some corporations were reshoring because they realized they were having no advantage at all in globalizing their manufacturing. In fact, the tipping point was going in favor of local because we understood our hidden costs more and we understood um, you know, some of the, some of the uh, soft costs, if you will, of, of factory landing costs. 2020, about now, it's, got, it's gone even further towards localizing manufacturing on paper, um, where we've seen a lot more challenges of the free trade idiom and a lot of reshoring underway. Certainly, for example, into NAFTA from uh, anything outside of NAFTA if you're in North America, and it's a much more complicated thing in the UK, I realize, with, with the European Union. But on paper, if you even if you take the tariff opportunities that government might provide out, you're still talking uh, almost uh, a 10 or, or 7% advantage in staying home. The future, if you employ industry four, and even if you employ industry four in both global and local um, environments, you detune the amount of sensitivity to low cost labor because if you look back at 2010, we had a five times differential of labor and overhead between offshore and onshore. But now with industry four pushing the labor out of the picture, it's only a two times factor at best. And so you're not sensitive to the need for low cost labor as much. And therefore industry four assists with the decision uh, to, to reshore and be and stay home with your manufacturing. And so really that's the summary. Labor differential is reduced through industry four as you've extracted a lot of the waste and the labor that goes with it. And there, therefore the advantage of low cost labor is far less important. And the other comment is that low cost labor countries tend to be less productive. They can afford to be, but when you do industry four, you actually tighten that up. And so even if you have higher cost labor in your, in your position or in your process, um, it's gonna be much more productive. The other issue that is driving this direction is that being close to the co consumer is far more important for a lot of corporations. The long supply chains aren't working for them. And so those two factors, the real cost of doing business, so to speak, of being close to the consumer is winning out, plus um, the realization that technology can help with level leveling that playing field. We now have a real strong case for going to a local trade jurisdiction for manufacturing. So that's why industry four just fits right into the journey for manufacturing being taken back. So having done that, we now, I think, begin to realize how important industry four is to undertake as quickly as possible. Um, and I'm gonna talk you through some of the best practices or, uh, you know, or basically a roadmap to under start undertaking the journey. The first thing to tell you is that you know, having been a lean practitioner for many decades, this feels almost the same. You know, industry four is like a lean transformation all over again. Um, so if you've already been through a lean transformation in your business and you have a journey underway, then you'll probably relate better to the amount of work you need to do to get industry four done. And of course to do that, so if you've not got an industry four uh, underway and you've not done lean yet, you've got double things to do. You've got to get a lean journey embedded with industry four if you've already got a lean journey underway, you need to strap on your industry four component, either which way you gotta go there. And there's two things you're gonna need. You're gonna need a strong vision of where you're headed, um, uh, which is what we learned with lean, um, and you're gonna need a roadmap to get there. So I'd like to share a roadmap with you um, exactly where that, that, that roadmap should take you. And if you look at it, it's pretty clear. It's a, it looks just like a lean journey. You need good vision and scope, um, and understand the, the requirements of Industry 4, and that will require some degree of education and research. Then you need to figure out the gap you're in, and we'll take you through a readiness survey profile that we think will help. 
and then you'll need to build your evolution plan to get there and then of course you have to execute and keep going so I'm just going to cover the first the first uh, box so some of you probably remember when if you've done a lean journey that you first of all had to look at your organization and realize that it was in vertical organizational silos a lot of companies are still there unfortunately but a lot of us have realized that this is the old way where we we have white spaces between our operations and and things take a long time to move through the operation we learn in lean and we, we started to structure our business to look more like this where we had interconnected loops or phases through our business that were seamless and, and everything ran more naturally through these five interconnected horizontal processes. Um, and and that's, there's, a, there's a, an article below that explains the journey that people were on to get more lean by using these five key business processes. It's the same thing for Industry 4. Um, we need to think of how, or how you would put Industry 4 on top of this lean culture that we've developed. And so what I'm gonna do is just tell you, hey, we already have a structure here. If you've already got these these five loops, let's take them, put them into a slightly different format, um, which I call five key business processes, and then overlay the block diagram that we recommend you look at uh, for Industry 4. So this is the Industry 4 major system functions. And so what I'd like to do now is just, just talk you through some of these major functions of Industry 4. There's a lot to learn and understand about how it all works together, but I'll just cover some of the big ones. The first one is uh, what we would, what I would call, you know, the elephant in the room in many businesses and has been for decades, which is the ERP system. Now, it's not important you, you worry about software, though that is obviously something you need, but you've got to make sure at least for industry four, whatever system you put in, whether it's high-end software or whatever you use, that it's seamless and it does the job of the, the intent of the ERP. It manages your demand, it turns demand into requirements, um, and then it manages all the data required to understand your capacity so you can you can function and make your business happen and ship your products. So you need that whatever you do um, and it needs to be you know a, a high-end capable ERP system. And I won't dwell any more on that right now. Just say that's really the given requirement. Second box is CAE. You know, a lot of people have spent quite a, a lot of effort on building their computer-aided engineering environment. I just want to comment that there's a lot to do here. You need, just as you, you have a manufacturing shop floor environment is computerized, you must get the engineering spaces to also be what somewhat computerized and, and seamless. And so through design for manufacturability uh, and through uh, building the right kind of software environment, uh, engineers can then work seamlessly together to take um, a journey through the product development, right from simulating the engineering effort so that they take the risk out of product development and do research early. The CAD CAM environment of making sure you've got up to the minute information in real time information for new products and then being able to deploy them into your process through computer aided process planning. And of course, right down at the, <clears throat> at the uh, quality arena, you need very strong computerized tools for inspection and test, uh, which would basically allow you to, um, uh, if you look at the bigger picture, learn everything you need to do with uh, your business. So if you look at the CAE environment, it probably is one of the most expensive items you're gonna buy uh, other outside of your manufacturing process, because that's a, there's a lot of transactions and a lot of knowledge required to do CAE well. Next box. is QMS, and the QMS box is, is a fairly new addition to the understanding for Industry 4, and this is quality management system. You know, we, we've had ISO for some time, and it's been, you know, uh, say what you do and do as you say, but really that's just part of it. We need to have a lot, a lot of high-end, much higher-end QMS environment, where you also need a very strong new product introduction environment to birth your new products, and tools therein, including things like Six Sigma, which needs to be automated, um, so it's better understood and make sure also that you've got a strong continuous improvement environment so that as you move forward you continuously build in a, an improvement mechanism in your business so QMS should be part of industry four and it should be a high-end computerized environment for people 
at the hub of this whole thing, we've got what, what is now called a MES, a Manufacturing Execution System. And this feeds off of the information out of the other three boxes and provides you with the infrastructure to automate and industry four eyes your, your shop floor. And so I want to go through the top three boxes that make up MES. Before I do, the bottom green is obviously the physical process. You've got a supply chain at the bottom um, that brings in the material, uh, stores it and deploys it. Then you've got a process uh, automation environment where you actually turn, you know, turn things into product, uh, add value uh, or your conversion steps, which is broken into the process centers as well as the work in process control between the centers. And then you've got a distribution system. So up at the top of that, to control over those things, you need a MES. And there's three main components of an MES that we define in industry four. And the first one, I want to make make them, you know, one of them is very important, but forgotten sometimes, is a very strong uh, total productive maintenance system. Now I'm talking about a very integrated way of doing maintenance. It's no longer an oily rag and a wrench. You know, it's it's much more than that now. It's got to be far more predictive and preventative, and it's got to be, you know, as you start to add complexity and and in, in technology into your business, um, it's got to work. It's got to be maintained. It's got to be um, it, it's got to be basically very reliable. And so, don't forget about adding the TPMS environment as you go uh, when you build your MES. And a lot of the modern MESs have realized this, and there's a strong TPM environment in the most MESs that are being evolved right now. So don't forget. Second one is the core, which is the factory data collection system. Now, there are many versions out there. Many people have the embryonics of a FDCS, but quite frankly, there's a lot of work to do, generally speaking, um, because you need it to actually communicate seamlessly with your management system um, at the top. Uh, and it needs also to go right down to the sharp end of your business where you actually control the process. Um, and most people are evolving to an OEE environment, or overall equipment effectiveness environment, so they can monitor performance um, of their of their business process steps. Um, now this has actually got you know a lot more to do. You want that that grassroots team to have the ability to form teams, identify problems, um, and solve them right there at the point of use. Okay, they can send on alarms and you know elevate issues, but it needs to be a real time solution system. And so most FDCSs now have a very strong continuous improvement environment built around them so that you can you can move right on through. You don't just define a problem or report a problem anymore. You do that, but you also fix it um, and then report how you fixed it so you can learn from it. So that's pretty much the, um, the FDCS environment that you need. And that really brings me to the third one, which is fairly new in a lot of cultures. Uh, this is pretty new technology, but this is how are you how are you going to manage the the inventory between your operations? Um, yes, you've got ERP to plan for it, but how are you physically going to manage your inventory? And so let me go to the next slide and explain that. What most people are looking at now, what cyber physical environments are going to look like is wireless positioning and sensing networks. And so imagine now your whole factory environment, all of the things that move in your business are GPS in a way so that we, we know where everything is at an instantaneous point in time. And so what that requires is sensorization, um, um, smart sensorization of everything that you move in your business. Um, and that's, that's done with a variety of different technologies, but most of them are gonna be wireless positioning um, and some will actually be capable of sensing. And so if you've got uh, batches that move through an operation um, or, or consignments to customers, you can tag them um, at high end. You'll know where they are within three inches, um, and you have the ability to globalize that and actually move it around uh, outside of your facility. But inside your facility, you have the ability to know where things are very close. The right technology will allow you to actually also know um, where your equipment that moves the items are. So you've got a complete lockstep, lockstep situation between the things that move items and the items that move themselves. Plus, you can add sensors to these tags so that you can monitor temperature, vibration, even color, air quality. So if you've got a product that's sensitive to its environment, or you can provide the, the sensor with information on what's happening in the process, 
you can then have real-time information on how good your batch is. So if you're in the food industry, you can actually find out how long it's been sitting in a bad environment for its safety. You can use it to basically improve your certification process, etc. And so this is a new cultural experience for a lot of people managing inventories because we get rid of transactions and we get rid of lack of information as far as the, the operating process is concerned, right down to the work cell level. So you can tag your equipment, you can tag your people, so you can you can manage uh, resources. Every everything that moves is known. So that's a sim environment, and a lot of organizations are struggling with the right technology to do that. And that's probably the newest component um, of the industry four environment. Those three things, the TPMS, FDCS, and SIMs, are the three main components of what most people are building into a manufacturing execution system. So let's go back to having understood a bit about the, the environment, that template. Let's take a look at what we have to do here. If we have a clear vision and scope of that business, um, then we can start to uh, understand how to actually make it better. So let's take a look at the next step we would do. We, we recommend that you undertake a readiness survey for Industry 4, even if you haven't started yet. Um, and so we, we've developed a, a technology checklist and implementation gap analysis that you you can team up with our, our team with and actually take take you through that readiness survey. Um, and by the way, this can also be used not only as a training aid to improve your vision and awareness of how you want to apply Industry 4, but it can be used as an ongoing scorecard uh, as you move through Industry 4 so you can see how you're doing. So let me tell you about the, let me explain this Industry 4 scorecard to you. We're going to use the same format. We're going to take the format we had before, which explained the major functions, and we're going to turn it into actually those five loops again and put it into a list with a few other things that are part of your infrastructure. And then we're going to put that list into a grid with a checklist structure. And so we'll end up with um, the, the, five, um, the seven key process systems that we've defined are necessary for Industry 4. And then a checklist group of five, which takes you through all the things you need to do, whether it's improving your lean environment, improving your engineering planning, um, where you are with automation and technology, and how your, your overall systems support Industry 4. So that checklist then is real time. You can use it to uh, re re basically benchmark where you are against um, where you want to go and also benchmark it against the best in class people that are doing stuff. And then you can bring in um, the experts to help you um, scorecard yourself and find out what your gap should be to improve. And so this, this readiness survey is a great learning aid for your organization to grapple with the journey for Industry 4. So after you've done that, of course, you need to build an evolution plan. You've done a lot of the work already with the readiness survey. Now you need to turn it into a, a series of projects. And we also have a 12-step implementation process for those that haven't already installed that uh, for their, their lean journey. The other thing is we're learning that um, not a lot of the, the market's still very fragmented in terms of provision. There's a lot of experts out there that offer parts of Industry 4. And so... I think what we offer also is providing a syndicate of all the experts that can engage in the readiness survey with you and then assist with the evolution plan as you so desire. And so here, here's the thing. It's a lot of work to do. You've got to avoid basically inventing the wheel. Um, and, and that's really a part of my final thoughts. Uh, as manufacturers, you're going to experience yet another sea change. Um, globalization, as I've described it, is going to change. It's not going to stay at its current format. Long global supply chains will contain and do contain waste, and that's going to be an issue. Um, they're going to be questioned, and you're going to shorten them. Uh, it's a perfect storm, in some cases, of fresh political will to actually look at your national situation as far as your economy is concerned. Industry 4 is going to enable um, that journey towards taking back manufacturing and deglobalizing, if you will. And also, Industry 4, um, if you connect it with your lean thinking, it's going to be a very strong roadmap for you to improve the situation in your manufacturing. Another statement I've already made is no single provider has all the solutions. It's really a syndicate requirement to get to the best solution, and that's really going to require some outside influence. Please don't waste your time inventing the wheel. Get help and 
get that help and get started on your roadmap. Hey, listen, there's no fine, there's no magic pills or, or magic wands. It's just like lean. We, we realize that we have to do it ourselves. We can't buy it in. Um, you need, need to lean with industry four and these disruptive technologies. It's, it's very important um, to be not, what, not so much in the lead, but be up with the leaders because unfortunately, if you don't, then you risk being disrupted by your competition. And that's really the end of my, 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 my package. Uh, I've given you some articles to read, which might assist you with some of the thinking I've given you. And I'm open to questions. Over to Jonathan. Thank you, Nigel. That was uh, an enlightening uh, introduction to uh, Industry 4.0 uh, and some of the challenges around supply chains and globalization. Um, so we have uh, a number of questions uh, that have come in. Uh, the first question uh, is, what is the single most important step in an Industry 4.0 journey? Um, I, I think I, I just, I'll just play my tape. I think it's strong visioning. Um, it, it's been true in, in, in lean. It's any significant change in business. You need to look at the business as a whole. Uh, so you need a holistic view of the business. You need to, you know, the first step is to sit down and understand exactly where your business is going, um, where you like it to go, and then visualize um, with a bit of, it, bit of knowledge of what we've just been talking about, what it can look like. I mean, that's, it doesn't have to end up that way, but if you don't have a vision, um, you know, any road will take you there. Um, and what I see the biggest downfall is people go buy bits of equipment thinking they're on the right track and they haven't thought through how this is going to be integrated. Because in, in industry four is an integration job. So that's, so visioning up front, planning up front is very important. Excellent. Thanks, Nigel. Um, the next question is, how do you build the business case for management support? I, I think I think that comes out of the vision. I mean, it's very. I think if you follow the um, the checklist uh, structure that we we, we recommend, um, you'll see. Quite frankly, you squeeze out waste. I mean, what you do, whether you whether it's because you've done lean already, or whether it's because you've taken lean to the next level with industry four, um, waste is a very powerful tool to actually show that you you know it's worth doing so every any time you take a dollar out and, and it's waste um it, you know it, you, you 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 not only get savings at the bottom line you also improve your capacity so if you if you're you know you you get more dollar per capital because you've actually improved the capacity as well as taking the waste out that gets you there so it's really a really a, a, a calculation of before and after picture i think a lot of people do is they incrementally try to um, generate a, a savings model. I think you sort of look at where you are today and then look forward five years, say, assuming that you've done it in five years, and then say before and after picture and the gap is the savings. And that's, that's, so I would look at the long range, I would look at long range savings, not, you know, tie your engineers down to inc inc small increments of improvement. Um, it, it's a strategic discussion, not a tactical discussion. Therefore, the, the savings need to be strategic, not tactical. Perfect. Thank you, Nigel. Um, so, um, is it possible to implement uh, Industry 4.0 in a manufacturing plant even without a perfectly running ERP system? That's a really good question. I mean, it depends what you mean by perfectly running. Um, <laughs> I mean, many, many experts would, would say that the answer is no. You can't do it because you, if you don't have good execution plans, you're not going to execute well. And you, you know, it doesn't matter how good your process is, um, or you know, in terms of how integrated it is, it won't run. It won't give you what you need. Um, I think, I think a lot of people need to re revalue what a good ERP system is for them. You know, there's a lot of stuff you put into an ERP system. It doesn't hit the bottom line. It doesn't help. So I think it's a question of defining exactly what shape the ERP system should be for your business, you know, what the what the most needed is in the business um, system, and then making sure you do that. And then stay away from the, the fancy stuff that some people sell in the ERP that doesn't actually do anything. For example, if you, if you spend a lot of effort on putting uh, manual transaction barcoding in, for example, and it, you know, in your system, you're worried it doesn't do that, you won't need barcodes. 
you know, you're going to need, uh, you're going to be using SIM systems. So, you know, some of the, some of the ERP environment will be transferred to an MES environment. And one of the big discussions is how much is going to get done by an ERP system and how much is going to get done by an, an MES system. And that mm. dialogue, and that dialogue needs to be well understood and to be part of the discussion about going through the checklist. A lot of, a lot of providers, this is actually an upwards, a, a bottom up strategy whereas ERP is a top-down strategy. They've got to meet in the middle somewhere. Yeah, that's a very, very interesting response. And I think in some parts, it leads us on to the next question, which is um, how do you monitor what's happening on the shop floor whilst it's happening without becoming so buried in the data that agile analysis and response become impossible in real time? Uh, yeah, uh, I think a smart factory data collection system, which is why it's a box in the, in the, in the model, has to be cleverly designed so that data is available, but you don't need it to run the operation. In other words, you've got to eliminate the transactions that are control transactions and make sure you, they become information transactions. So I want less transactional control and more transactional information. And that's so that the, the, the machine knows what to do. You don't have to tell it anything, if you will, but you know exactly what it's doing, okay? which is not the way we do it. We tend to have to push buttons and, you know, wait for the next transaction to happen before we can move forward. And then we bog down, which is exactly what that question's about. Um, that's not the way to go. You've got to engineer it so that it's, it's seamless at the operational level, but you know things are going well because you're monitoring the data coming in. Okay, okay. And the next, the next question is a two-part question. Um, and it starts, how are the elements of manufacturing 4.0 identified and during lean and capital developments are they effective and measured and then the second part is the aim should be to ensure capital support from government provides the correct return for the tax base and the investment climate what are your thoughts well, up upon this that's a lot of questions <laughs> <laughs> it is it is um the first one was uh say the first one again i want to make sure i get it right Okay, so the first one was, um, how are the elements of manufacturing 4.0 identified okay. and during lean and capital developments, are they effective and measured? Yeah, I think that's part of the checklist. I think I think the survey needs to cover that. I think you, you've got to, uh, first of all, design something that's going to work for the business and then make sure that, you know, that that is bountiful in terms of the output output of the business. And that will that will give you the savings profile. Um, and then, and then, and I think I think it's 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 simple once you understand what what the benefits are by by doing the checklist. Um, and, and again, it's got to be more strategic than tactical. If you just pick one machine and it's not the bottleneck of the business, and you improve that, that's not going to help the bottom line. Okay, you might save a bit of effort, but it's not really strategic. You got to look at the bigger picture and get the you know get the output up across the whole system so it's it's lean thinking you know it's, it's applying lean thinking to your savings and then strapping the power of of cyber physical systems on top of it which takes you to another level so if you if you just do cyber physical and you don't put lean into the picture uh, you might get caught with that 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 discussion or that question so i think the answer is use lean thinking first and then then uh, industry four afterwards and then the second question was um what does government do? Um, I, it was I, uh, the aim should be to ensure capital support from government provides right. the correct return for the tax base and the investment climate. That again, uh, if you do your, if you do, if you use the survey correctly, it, it falls out. You know, we've, I've seen many, certainly in North America. I mean, Canada has similar programs. I mean, if, once you do the homework on what I, you know, you've got a good plan. Normally, it's pretty simple to relate that to a savings profile that the government would pay for. Um, and as, as you've seen, and there's a lot of um, options there in terms of how that, and that gets interpreted as a government saving or, or a saving that would pay for by the government. Um, I, I, think, I think there's some parts that won't jive, um, but you know, inventory, for example, one of the big uh, arguments would be, well, inventory is an asset. Really? <laughs> So, you know, some financial institutions think that if you've got more inventory, you're, you're better off and you've got, you've got a healthier book. But quite frankly, um, you know, some of the rules of engagement of finances may have to change um, and, and you have to rebuild a different model for the benefits of reducing things like inventory. But those are arguments we've had for 
you know, forever. I mean, some of these things are about smart, smart uh, cost justifications. But the government, the, the stuff I've seen from the government is pretty on track. I mean, they talk about lean uh, in the in this in the surveys they ask for when you when you go for funding. Um, and I, I not unless the UK is totally different. Uh, the experts that the government use are very up on uh, the, the modern concepts of how manufacturing should look. So I think I think it takes care of itself if you follow the trail, do do you know follow the roadmap and end up with a plan that you can then strap around um, your savings your savings from the government. But I don't think it's a problem if you do it right. But you got to look at it. You got to look at it strategically. That's the trick. You got to if you don't if you just pick one machine. And, and try to prove that that's a saving that might not work but if you pick the whole process um, and I think then you can fund it better. That's fantastic thank you very much. So that brings us to the end of our presentation for today uh, all of the questions uh, that were pushed through have been responded to. Um, I would like to personally thank you Nigel for taking the time today um, to just give us a little bit of insight uh, and the benefit of your experience and knowledge uh, into Industry 4.0 uh, and of course bringing manufacturing home. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Marina, uh, our marketing head, um, for organising today's session uh, and of course most of all I'd like to thank all of the attendees uh, for spending their time this Friday afternoon uh, to come along and have a look at uh, the information that we've presented. Following the session today, uh, if there's anything that we can help you with, with, if you have any additional questions or need further help, please feel free to reach out to us using the contact details uh, on the screen now. Um, and all that remains really is for me to say thanks very much to everybody again and to wish you a fantastic remainder of the day. Thank you. Thank you.